All right, what up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Living the Dream podcast. Today on the show, we have J.V. Hilliard, who is an author that also has a bunch of other stuff going on. <laughs> Joe, how you doing? I'm doing well, man. Hey, thanks for having me tonight. I appreciate that. Of course. No, thanks for coming on. And we like to jump right in. So if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and the bunch of other stuff you got going on. Yeah, well sure. What you like to do for fun. That'd be yeah, cool. sure. So uh, I am a fantasy adventure author. I, I write what it would be described as epic fantasy or dark fantasy. Uh, so the kind of stuff I write is is a bit of Tolkien. If you like Lord of the Rings or, or Hobbit, it's that that's sort of like the epic fantasy stuff that's part of it or or the dark fantasy stuff because i add a little bit of gothic a little bit of of horror into my novels so uh it's a it's a lot of fun you know and i've got the second of the series coming out here in september uh followed with the third around the holidays and the last uh will come out right around april of 2023 so the warminster series which is known as uh, is what i'm doing now uh in terms of my my publishing you know, first book is the last keeper uh, which has been out since the holidays. And the second one comes out, like I said, uh, next month. Uh, and then on the other side of things, uh, my intellectual property is being licensed to a company called Melderverse, and they're making a melded reality video game out of it. So if you're a fan of playing Pokemon Go or Harry Potter on your cell phones, or you you have your VR goggles in your basement, you jump on your Oculus, you'll be able to play this, even if you just want to play it on your computer. And it's a way of, of taking my game taking a role-playing game and, and pushing it into a, a video game and introduce oh. introducing it and so the first uh beta for that will come out sometime second quarter of of 2023 uh and i'm in the process of also uh relaunching an uh online magazine called altered reality uh, which focuses on speculative fiction uh including things like sci-fi and fantasy on on my side of the table or even things like speculative poetry it's a place for authors to come and and publish their work um and i hope to give them a sort of a big push for that so lots going on there we go there we go i love it and for fun between all of that is your fun mostly writing or is there other stuff that you do no like i i gotta be honest with you i mean I, i've always wanted to be a writer so it's something that's been in the back of my head since i was a kid and i didn't have a chance to really get into it until COVID hit my day job I've got a weird day job, man. Like I'm a lobbyist in DC. So I, I, I do defense lobbying and technology lobbying primarily. Right. So I get a real big dose of reality. So this is my escapism. You All know, right. I look, I, I look at writing as, as my way of doing something that's completely off the wall and it takes me out of, you know, the, the craziness of the world and doing that stuff. But I like, you know, to be honest, I love playing fantasy football. Uh, I got the, the seasons coming up here real soon, but I also play, uh, a lot of Dungeons and Dragons, and I get some ideas for my novels uh, from my tabletop role playing, and I've been doing that for about twenty years, maybe thirty years now, with um, with some of my friends. Even when we were like right out of elementary, or going into middle school, I feel like if I rewound the clock, I'd be like those kids from Stranger Things. You yeah, know, like that. That was that was me then. I'm still doing it, and we we play on 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 Skype uh, every Sunday night, and you know, again, I get some of my escapism from that. So those are, I think. Between fantasy football and, and and that that I've got enough hobbies, but I, you know I keep busy, man. I'm 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 a mover. <laughs> I'm, not, go. I'm not going to gather any moss. <laughs> there we go. There we go. I love it. I love it, man. You've been playing Dungeons and Dragons for the past twenty years. You said nerd, man. I am a geek to no, the core. I love it. Dungeons and Dragons seems so. It's kind of like it's like a video game in real life. Yeah, you know, I, I I I liken it to a group of friends having a group delusion, and you're playing a game through this imaginary, you know, story that you're walking through, and uh, it's a lot of fun, you know. And you could make it any way you want it to be. Like we play a lot of strategy and tactics. We like to get into the rules, and you know, we're now on fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, but we've been playing it since the first edition. You know, so for us, you know, we've seen many of the changes and for the good, the bad and the ugly that it's come from it. And this new edition's really kind of refreshed it for us. And we get, you know, to play with new spells and new rules, and new characters and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that. So we really nerd out about it, have a good time doing it. So, you know, I don't know. Have you ever played? Are you a fan? I have watched some gameplay. I was trying mm -hmm. to get together and play with some friends, but we can never get a good group. 
But I sat there and watched the gameplay for like three hours, four hours one night. And I was like, the fact that I just sat here and watched this for three to four hours means it must be pretty fun. So Yeah. No, I'm telling you, man, it, it's it it when you're in it, it's it's almost like you're I, this is a true story. Like when we get together, our wives will make fun of us because we will be talking about the game as if it was real. Like and we'll talk to each other as you know, the you just you do you remember when your player when your character did this or when and we'll name the names and they'll all be looking at us like what are you guys yeah. talking about? Yeah. You're you're nuts. And the, you know, don't you guys want to get together and play poker or or <laughs> you know smoke cigars? And it's like no, we want to nerd out playing this and every now and then a football game or a hockey game will sneak in there. So yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, tell us a bit more about your motivation. What gets you up and keeps you going every day? Well, you know, a, a couple of things. I mean, I've um you know, I honestly, I, I love to write, you know, so for me, I got to start it on it a little later than life than, than, than most, but I wrote every day since middle school, right? Like I, my uncle um, was paralyzed in the war. And when he came home, my mother was his nurse and he, you know, so I basically grew up in his, in his bedroom and there was only a certain amount of things he could do. And so when I was very young. One of the things he taught me early on was writing because that was his form of escapism. He could get out of his wheelchair or eventually when he was bedridden he could write and it was an old-fashioned typewriter and you know i i kind of you know i looked up to him like he was a second father to me uh and then you know the other part of it was dungeons and dragons you know it was something another form of escapism for him and so those things you know kind of have come together to motivate me to write and i started writing when i was younger but then i got into to uh, politics and government and economics and it led me in a different direction and i write every day whether it's a policy paper or legislation, or, but it's all nonfiction. It's all boring stuff that would put your, your, your viewers to, to sleep, you know, and then COVID hit and my wife looked at me and she's like, you're not going to sit around and do nothing for like a year. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was like, no, 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 no. no. So I, I ended up using that energy and I focused that really onto, you know, writing what I thought was going to be a novel that turned into a, you know, a series. So I've had a lot of fun with it. And that's, one of the things I've, I've always wanted to do is on my bucket list of, of things to accomplish, but I'm also motivated. Um, you know, I, I, I love working on veterans issues. So I'm involved in a number of veterans organizations around here. Uh, again, it gets, it gets back to my uncle, really. It's something that I've learned as a, as a young kid. I, and I, so I, I always kind of, you know, aspire to be active in that community. And I've served on a number of veteran uh, organizations, boards and helped them do fundraising and, uh, and things like that. And I'm working with a couple now. So, you know, those are the kind of things to get me up and, and move. And I'd love to one day uh, be wealthy enough to create my own foundation and give back to the community. So that that hasn't happened yet. But, you know, knock on wood, maybe who knows uh, it does. And I can help in, in that regard, too. But right now I, I enjoy uh, I enjoy writing and uh, it, it motivates me. And, and same thing with uh, being part of my community. Love it. I love it. And now we're going to jump into your dreams and goals. So you uh -oh. mentioned one, talking about being wealthy enough to have a foundation. But tell us about your vision for your life and your career. Yeah. So, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to have kicked a number of the stuff off of my bucket list that I want to do. I've always wanted to be a writer. I've always wanted to own my own businesses. And I'm, I'm, I've been doing both of those now for for quite some time. So for my professional career is kind of taken and taken care of itself. And at home, I married the girl of my dreams and we build a house together. And so all those kind of things I've been able to kind of tick off the, the list is as I go, but I mean, the stuff that's staring me in his face um, is I, I mentioned a little earlier that I'm, I'm doing this, you know, melded reality game. I would love um, for that to really kind of take off. And, and the way it's being set up is um, you know, there, you know, each of my books is going to be another challenge for those that are playing in the game. So it's just like you're, you're playing a Madden, you know, every year there's a new game that comes out. Same thing here. It's going to be the launch of the next uh, edition of the realm of Warminster. And, uh, and I think I've been able to also with the, with taking over the altered reality magazine, what I'm looking for there is to help other authors pull them into what we do. What I've found is for the love of, of writing, you know, I've found a hobby, you know, that's become a career path uh, and others. I've talked to a lot of people that I would love for them to, that, that I know they're good writers and they've got good stories. They just need to be motivated or, or coaxed into joining the club a little bit. Uh, you know, and I'm even doing a speech at a local community college here next month 
um, you know, and it's called a book camp instead of a boot camp. And the idea is, is, you know, really kind of getting, you know, authors in the community, want to be authors in the community to come out and learn about what you can do um, and, uh, you know, why you should jump into this and write. And, you know, and so I'll give them my story about how it happened to me and, and how rewarding it is. And I think, you know, professionally, if I can make authorship my full-time job, I would love it. But it's, you know, it doesn't pay as well as my professional stuff, unfortunately. But I'm hoping here in the back nine, I get to flip-flop that around and I could do some, I could do some writing on a day-to-day -day basis. That would be fun. Okay. Okay. So I got have the melted reality game take off. Yep. Yeah, so it took off uh, accidentally. Um, one of the guys that, well, the CEO of the company and I knew each other 20 years ago uh, in a different iteration of both of our lives professionally. And, um, you know, it turns out that he uh, bought the book, read it, saw that I had written it and reached out to me and said, hey, you know, uh, we're making this game. You could be the first author to have a, you know, a, a melded reality game. Um, after your your stuff, would you be interested in, in licensing uh, the Realm of Warminster uh, piece over to us? And so we got together and started talking about it. And when he convinced me, you know, to take the leap, because in the beginning here, I, you know, you get this, everybody gets this, like, it, you know, if you write something, everyone says, oh, do you want it to be a movie? Or do you want it to be a TV show? Um, yeah, sure. That'd be great. And then I get this random call about video game. Yeah. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm a gamer. This is right up my alley. And I was like, well, maybe this is sort of that golden egg that kind of drops right in front of your door. And so I, you know, I, I listened to Jay. I had a chance to chat with him about what his vision of it was and wanted to make sure it aligned with what I was doing. And, you know, of course, I'm going to have some sort of, you know, artistic say on, on how the game progresses. Not everything in the books can appear in the game. Um, and I understand that, but at least being able to follow along the basic plot lines and, you know, and, and the characters that are in there. And the thing that really interested me was, he came at it from a different perspective. He said, look, you know, not only are we going to do a game here, but we're also going to offer this through um, NFTs. You know, we want to make, you know, NFTs part of this. And we just launched our first one uh, this week. Um, and um, I think we sold almost 40 uh, in one day. And, uh, you know, the, the concept there is taking little things that will gamify the process of getting to the game so you're getting a util. It's not just a an artistic, you know, uh, electronic form of art. It's now there's some utilitarianism in it. There's a there's a utility to it that you can use, um, and you can redeem these things in real life for stuff. So if your character slays the dragon and opens the treasure chest and finds a bunch of stuff that you can level up in, that's one thing. But you're also going to find some things in there that are NFTs that are re redeemable. In real life and what i mean by that is you know you might get a note saying you know to complete your quest go to your local starbucks or your subway or wherever and then you know scan this qr code and you go there and you do that and they say congratulations you're now a second level knight or whatever uh have a free drink and a two dollars off your sub or have a free you know coke and a smile right so there's a lot of things we're doing with that that uh, you know kind of bolt onto the commercial aspects of it and and i think that's really super exciting stuff yeah that is so cool thanks man yeah i like that a lot yep so for dreams and goals got make authorship your full-time gig on the back nine. Oh, i would love it would love have, it have this game take off as it gets launched and ready and then bring other authors into the author world yep awesome any other dreams or goals you want to chat about no you know i i think that you know the altered reality magazine is going to be a fun one, right? The, the woman who set that up originally, her name is Kelly. Uh, she did it altruistically. She was trying to help other authors do this. And she's at a point in her life where she just can't continue to manage it. And, and I was a writer for her. She gave me one of my first opportunities to publish something in her magazine. Uh, and in my case, it was a serial. And if you're not sure what a serial is, instead of uh, an entire book, every month you get 1500 words it's like reading a, a mini chapter yeah. and she would publish that and it was and you know folks especially i think millennials and, and gen z's like the snack size stuff you know when you walk in and you're here's a 500 page epic fantasy book they're they're, they're not as reactive to that as as you know folks that are gen x or, or older uh and this is a way to ingratiate yourself into the same genre 
with a younger crowd uh, and and or you get folks that are reading this on the bus on the way to work or on the subway or you know they've got kids and you know different stages in life and this is a way for them to to enjoy that so I, I started writing it I got familiar with some of the other authors you know in that group and when she approached me about taking it over because I've owned a number of businesses in the past you know I jumped at it and I'm really looking to kind of making this thing hypersonic right there's some things in there that we're going to change a lot of it we're going to keep the same she's been doing such a great job with it it's hard to say that i would want to do something else uh with it but i, I think that from my perspective uh you know we've got a few ideas and i'm going to invite some people to be part of that so i'm looking forward to really kind of jumping at that there we go there we go and is that going to be the main way that you're bringing authors into the world uh yeah one of the two right so the the first one is is that i think i can reach that's a global reach, right? I mean, she's got like 150,000 uh, visitors to her site. And, you know, I mean, it's it's a pretty popular, um, you know, place to go for speculative fiction. Um, what I'd like to do with that is, of course, reach those that are already there and then reach out to others through that. And then locally, you know, really being involved in the community college here. I've been involved in a couple of writing groups, folks that come to my book signings, whether they're at a library or a convention or a local bookstore, um, they come and in, I, invariably somebody there tells me how they want to be a writer. You know, the, I just did one at the Moon Township Library on what's today, Thursday. I did it on Tuesday night. 12 year old kid comes up to me and says, you know, he was kind of embarrassed. Like, that's not a cool thing to be doing when you're 12. You know, and, and he said, well, when did you start writing? And I said, fourth grade. You know, it was the same same kind of thing. And by the end of the conversation, his parents had given me the opportunity to send him some additional information. I gave him a free book and, you know, I, and I'm hoping that he responds and sends me what he wrote yeah. uh, because I'd like to be able to critique that. So I know that's one anecdotal, you know, kind of example or story, but I get that a lot when people are like, Hey, I'd love to do this. Or when I'm on shows like this and people are like, Oh yeah, I want, I'd love to write. I've got this idea for, I, Reno, a guy at Panera one time, he saw me writing and he said, I, I, you know, I want to write a screenplay. I've got a great idea for a screenplay. And, and it just, it just, it's amazing how it like, it starts to flow. And I find that creative people get more creative when, when they're around others and it doesn't, they don't have to be writers. So, you know, like when I get stuck, I reach out to my D and D group and I'm like, Hey, how would you guys do this in the plot? Or do you have any ideas or help me brainstorm this? But it, it could be an artist, it could be an author, it could be a poet. You know, I one of the I, I was at a comic book store uh, back in uh, for Free Comic Book Day, and um, the you know I, was, I had a table there, and and this woman came up to me and she's like, "I'm I'm a poetess and I'd love to to write poetry. I don't know where to go." And it's just a matter of connecting her back to people, and she's going to be an artist on altered reality so i think there's something local you can do and i think this this altered reality magazine thing gives me a global platform to to kind of be doing that stuff so yeah. um i hope that answers your question man i was a little long-winded but you got me excited there i can you i hope you can feel the passion oh yeah uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> no i love it that's uh yeah. that's the purpose of bringing people on the show i, lo yeah. I love the energy people get when they start talking about stuff they love yeah there was yeah. or you, you you i'm sure you get this like every 50 minutes you're doing this and you knock off a couple of these a day you get a lot of people like me <laughs> yeah yeah but that was that was the idea right i wanted to i wanted to have that energy man it's the greatest cool. the greatest thing in the world so awesome oh yeah rant rant on is what i said yeah. <laughs> awesome well if there were one or two people that you could meet right now and this could be a specific person or a type of person and they'd really help you take the next step towards bringing all these dreams and goals into reality. Yeah. Who would they be and how would they help you? So uh, I've got two, right? Uh, the first one is on the game side, right? I mean, there's a guy named Ryan Cohen, who's the head of uh, GameStop. Uh, and the guy is is brilliant. Like I, I think a lot of people in the community see him as the the next Steve Jobs. The guy is just, he, and what he's doing with the relaunch of GameStop, I think our melded reality game might be able to fit in there in some sort of creative capacity with him. And I think if he would, you know, pay attention, give me, give me, I don't even need an entire lunch. Just give me like five minutes. I'll buy you a cup of coffee while you're in line at Starbucks with me. I'll make sure that you, you you're going to hear my elevator pitch on, on what we're doing. And, and I think a guy like, like Ryan continuing to build in that community, uh, continuing to be open to other creatives that want to be 
you know, part of that team that are not just on the video game side, but bringing other things like this, what wouldn't be a video game if it weren't for the novels, right? I mean, the novels are literally the thing that's catapulted, you know, this into where it is. And so I'm sure there's other examples of that too, where you, he can be involved and be helpful on the authorship side. You know, I, I think my modern day hero is a guy named R.A. Salvatore. Um, I read a lot, as you can imagine, and he's written a series of nearly 40 books um, that are, you know, that have started, again, he was a Dungeons and Dragons fan fiction guy, and it turned into him writing this very successful book on things called the Dark Elf Trilogy, back when the first three books, and then that blew up into 40, and there's this main character, Dritz, that goes through that, and I would love to pick his brain, not mentor-mentee kind of thing, but more, you know, how did he find such a fan following for yeah. his characters and and what they've done? Uh, and I'd love to be able to, you know, kind of pick his brain on on how he thinks because I I'm one of those guys that I need a plan. Like I, there are folks out there that sit down in my business. They're called pantsers, you know, and these people sit down and they can write by the seat of their pants, and it just flows. And then they get stuck and they don't know how to end things and. You know, cause they, they, they wrote to a point and then they're like, well, oh, how do I get, how do I finish this? Yeah. I'm the opposite of that. Like I write my stories backward. So I start at the end and I plan everything. So there's not a single piece of real estate in my novels that isn't accounted for. If it's in there, it's in there for a reason. And it might be foreshadowing. It might be a little historical stuff on, on, on everybody or whatever it might be. But, you know, I, I, I do that. But if you ask me to sit down and start writing a story, like it's a dark and stormy night. I'm going to freeze up. I am horrible. Like I can't, I have to plan everything, you know, and I would love to see, I don't know what his process is. I don't know how he handles that stuff, but I would love to go in there and say, look, I love the stuff that you do. And I would love to learn how you do it. So, you know, that's the guy I'll take the coffee with Ryan Cohen. I'll take the, the extended lunch and cocktails with R.A. Salvatore. There we go. There we go. I yeah. love it. Just curious, at what point did his fan following pop up? Was it like book 17? Was it book one? Was it book 39? Well, yeah, he was, you know, the answer to that question is I really don't know. I started following him um, when I was reading. I, I obviously playing Dungeons and Dragons. I would read a lot of Dungeons and Dragons fan fiction. And so by way of example, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman write the, you know, the, the Dragonlance series and and, 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 and R.A., you know wrote this series through their forgot their launch of their forgotten realms sort of campaign and he made up a character and i'm i'm assuming he might have even played that character in his D, D days you know and the idea was you know kind of take what you played and make it into a book and i you know i noticed the the uptick in it when it was still in the early stages of it and that's when i started being a fan of his um you know and and i think that it just has taken off i'm waiting for the movie you know or you know the the graphic novel you know kind of thing like you know the, the, because it's it's just that good but by the end of the day i i think that you know he started and I, i'm gonna guess it was at the end of the first series maybe the second series where it really started to see that sort of hockey stick uh, where people picked up so i'm hoping the same thing happens to mine i'm only on book two so yeah. the end of book four i'll let you know there we go, <laughs> there we go. Well, awesome. Name the most important one or two things that everyday people can do to help you accomplish your goals. So you meet Sally at the grocery store and mm -hmm. Sally's like, yo, Joe, how can I help you out? What would you do? Yeah. So, you know, first of, first of all, it's, you know, some of this is a bit self-serving, right? But like, you know, I get motivated when people tell me that they read my stuff. You know, they can tell me what they didn't like. I'll give you a perfect example of one. I got a review one time. Uh, it was on Amazon and they gave me a two star review and the woman wrote in there and said, oh, my God, I wanted to love this book so much. I, I picked it up because of the cover and I only got 50 pages in it. I couldn't finish it, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, devastated when you read something like that. Uh, and then I realized a couple of things. I said, one, the constructive criticism in there is that, you know, my book might not be for everybody. The kind of stuff I write might not be for everybody. So thank you for giving it a chance. But the good news was <laughs> the cover did its job. It's sold, <laughs> you know? And so like, I, I, there's part, I was like, all right, all right, you know, it's like a backhanded compliment. I bought it for the cover. Well, great. That's exactly what the covers are supposed to do. Yeah. But you know, if someone comes up to me and asks me questions or 
tells me like when I, I get this a lot of book signings where they tell me who their favorite character is like i you know there's there's a couple of characters that i didn't expect that have this little cult following that's going on i have it i literally have this evil assassin guy and people are like oh man i hope you don't kill him he's like your boba fett and you're like oh he's the bad guy like I'm, <laughs> you're cheering for the bad guy right you know and that kind of stuff it just it motivates me. So when people come up to me and tell me, you know, one, they wish me success or, Hey, you know, I bought that for my kid or I bought that for my husband. Cause he reads this stuff or I never thought I would expect it to like this. And I'd listen to your audio book and, you know, I can't wait for the next one. That kind of stuff motivates you and it keeps you wanting to do more because it takes a while to build a following. And with those followings comes the ability to continue to write. I mean, you need to make money doing this it is a business your publisher expects you to be out there on the road and and selling and and, and going to conventions and all that kind of stuff and you know if people were coming up to you and telling you that that's that's the kind of thing that that motivates me the other thing is tell me what you like i mean i gave that example of the assassin but hey i'm the author i can make these things. if if there's 30 people that contact me and tell me that they like my barbarian hobbit character that rides a war horse named after my old dog uh, you know, like then I know not to make, maybe he has a little bit more, you know, uh, limelight in the next book or, you know, you know, they have their, or they have an origin story written on the side that they can download for free and, you know, all that other kind of stuff. And I love that feedback, good, bad, or ugly. It's helpful for me. And so that's what Sally in the grocery store can, can do to me to keep me ready. There we go. There we go. I love it. And now we're going to jump into our thriving three. So the first question is, what is your favorite book, movie, or podcast? Pick one. So my favorite book is Dracula. Uh, it was, I mean, it, I know that might not be on everybody's <laughs> everybody's list. Yeah. And the thing's been a bestseller twice. I mean, it literally is, um, Stoker did such a great job. And I'm a, such a fan of the Gothic that, you know, I, I'll read that stuff every Halloween just to refresh it and keep it fresh in my mind. Um, and, you know, I think we've seen so many movies and spinoffs and shows and the whole, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and Twilight, that's all because of Dracula, right? And I think there's something to be to be said about that, you know, and it's a couple hundred years old and people still read it. And, you know, when he was writing it, he was he was writing it in and he was dropping little things in there. He had technological advances or you know he would do stuff that happened in real life and he would scare people by putting it in the book like there was a literally a, like a russian schooner that sailed into one of these harbors that happened in real life where there was no one on the boat everybody was gone and he used that and in his novel and dracula basically killed everybody on the boat ate them while he was on the boat you know, drank their blood, threw them overboard, killed them, whatever he did. Yeah. And then the boat sailed in and no one knew who was there. Right. And it, and it was his arrival or the, the murders that he had done were all around the same area that, um, you know, the Jack, the Ripper murders had happened. And this was coming out right around the same time. So like that kind of stuff, like I've, I've taken lessons from that and I've been taken stuff that I've done in my life or have seen done in my life, whether it's through my professional career in Washington, D.C., and I see some cool stuff coming out of the Pentagon or, you know, the the realism of being involved in everyday politics and then being able to build that into a political scene, in this case, more medieval, that are fighting between kings and stuff like that. And there's just so much to learn from a classic like that. And so I think that's 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 my favorite. And I know that's a bit out of my genre, but it's my favorite. There we go. There yeah. we go. And what's one way you like to take care of yourself? You know, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, and I know a lot of people uh, joke about that these days. I don't get upset about it. It doesn't matter to me because I, I know what they're saying. You know, when people say, oh, I like to organize my stuff. Well, yeah, that's great, but that's not what OCD is. Uh, and, you know, for me, um, you know, I've been able to, to I think, harness that in, in two ways, and I've tried to turn it to my advantage. When you when you have OCD, depending on the type that you have, um you can you can become a perfectionist at times and i think that's good when you're a writer <laughs> you, you know you don't want to leave any holes in the plots you don't want to have any errors in the page so i will re, re i just literally sent a correction to my publisher today asking her to make a change she said stop reading it's okay stop <laughs> reading don't send me anymore we're going man we're going with what we got 
Um, but I also think that what I do is, is I make lists and, you know, in part that's, you know, I've been able to use that as an, as an advantage. I've taken my condition and I've made it a, a strength and that those lists act as a checklist, a to-do list for me. And, mm-hmm. you know, I check everything off every day uh, to make sure that I can complete everything in the, in that I need to do, you know, and that keeps me mentally healthy. You know, the physical stuff, pretty easy, man. If you haven't heard my dog scratching on the on the door wanting to go out during this interview, they're looking to go for a walk, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so I, I walk about four miles a day with these guys. Um, and I've got a, I've got a Siberian Husky named Thor and a red Fox lab retriever named McLeod after uh, Connor McLeod of the, the Highlander uh, uh-huh. movies. And uh, they, they are, they're big dogs, good dogs, but they, they need their walks. So that's how I, that's how I stay healthy. Uh, you know, with the, uh, clocking in at four miles a day (laughs) (laughs) there we go there we go and what is one action step you can take right now or continue to take if you're already doing it to meet ra salvatore so for me that's a bit of a cheat because um his his uh editor is my editor and uh his voice actor is also my voice actor right a lot of people that listen to audiobooks uh, have a tendency. I mean, when you when you listen to a voice and the voice comes across in a certain genre, they start to have their own following as part of that. And so it just professionally worked out that I've got to meet them. So I know eventually if I wanted to push it and and did it, I'm sure that they could they could hook me up. But you know, I don't I don't like taking advantage of that. And you know, I I don't you know I, I just you know it's it's one of those things. If it happens organically, I would uh, I'd love for it to happen just to have that conversation. But I also know that. You know, his his goal is probably not to meet with me. <laughs> you know, he's got like ten of those requests a day, I'm sure. But you know, if I wanted to go stalkery, I could probably get there and make it look very professional. Uh, but uh, you know, I think I think for now, when it, it'll happen, it'll happen. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure, I feel that. Yeah. That is a. Uh... I mean, honestly, you are probably in the best position for a meet to organically happen at than anybody who has been on the show <laughs> so <laughs> and it just was random it happened that way like i got referred he he put out a tweet saying anybody looking for an editor should use phil and i reached out and used phil and i told him that you know ra referred me and then i tweeted him and i was like hey man thanks for the referral phil's aces and he like liked that back and he followed me and i was like oh man pretty cool guy open-minded not 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 afraid of, of any of that kind of stuff and then it just turned out that I got a referral into Victor, who's doing the the voiceover. And I, you know, and as soon as I heard his voice, I was like, oh, this is the guy that does the Dark Elf trilogy. I was like, yeah, you're, of course you're in, you know, I'll hire you yeah. now. You know, so, but I, I don't, I, I've never, I'm not going to hold that over their head or anything like that, but you're right. I, I could, I could probably get there if I wanted to. And if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, that's all right. <laughs> no, you should do. You should just throw like a party of all your and like to celebrate some of your favorite authors since he's following you on twitter yeah <laughs> invite him to the party and be like hey i'm celebrating like five people who have really influenced my writing would love for you to come if you can't make it there'll still be a thing in your honor totally no that's way that's slick man that's <laughs> that's pretty that's slick i like that now i'm gonna hmm. that my friend is going on my ocd list <laughs> I don't know if I can accomplish that in a day, but I'm going to, I'm going to try it. We'll see how that goes. I'll work. I got to work that one. So, you know, I know he doesn't do a lot of like, he does enough public stuff. Um, you know, I'll eventually run into him at a convention. I'm going to guess, yeah. you know, where he'll be, you know, in the big room and I'll be in the, you know, the corner of the, with the smoking tables or wherever yeah, they yeah. are these days. <laughs> yeah. They'll, <laughs> you know, we're there. We'll, we'll run into each other in the hallway. Right. So like, yeah. it'll, it'll be fine. So there we go. I love it. Well, now we're going to jump into our final series of questions. Far away. And I did not send these beforehand. So mm-hmm. feel free to say, I don't know. And they require a bit of pretext. So stick with me as I read them. So a lot of people have come on the podcast and they've said that the catalyst that helps people change from having a fixed mindset, not willing to accept help and not willing to accept change to having a growth mindset, being willing to accept help and being willing to accept change the catalyst that helps people make that switch is a personal choice that happens after either extreme inspiration or extreme desperation. 
Do you agree, disagree, have anything to add or subtract? I would absolutely agree to that. Uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, even if you look at it at its base, you know, I the, the old saying that, uh, you know, uh, invention is the, the, the child of necessity, you know what I mean? Yep. And, um, you know, they, the, those kind of things happen. And when you get backed into a corner and you're desperate, you often will look for alternative ways that you may not have looked for before. And I think we've all been there. Uh, in our life. Uh, but I also think that when you're inspired to do something, whether it's something you're doing for your community or you're, something you're doing for your church, or whether it's something that you've always wanted to do and you're you're taking a stab at it, those are the times where I think your mind opens up the most because you're looking for something there. And I think that quote is dead on. I think that challenge is dead on because you sit around doing the same thing all the time, it becomes humdrum and then you do get closed-minded. You, you see the same stuff uh, you know, all the time that passes you by. And I think in this case, I think your the the pretext of your question is one that I would agree with almost a hundred percent. I love it. I love it. I love what you said about you connected seeing the same stimuli to being closed minded. I really like that connection. Yeah, well, think about that. I mean, if you haven't seen anything new, you're just gonna know what's in your little world, right? And in, unless you go out and do that, I'll, I mean. I do that all the time. I travel a lot. And so you see places that you would never see. Yeah. And, but if you're only in your own neighborhood or you're only in, and some of that, look, it just happens. I'm, you, you know, I travel for work and I love to travel as a hobby, you know? So for, for me, I've got places that I want to see in this world before I go, yeah. you know? And, and so I, I, you know, I, 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 you need to do that. And when you go to places you, you realize you, it opens your mind to things because you see that they can be done differently or they are done differently. And sometimes they're doing better in places where you, you're not even sure you didn't even know that it, they existed there. Um, you know, and I come from a pretty poor family. We lived in uh, projects when I was growing up yep. and, you know, we ended up, my, my dad was a steel worker, um, you know, before all the mills closed uh, and he was able to get us out of the projects and we moved to a pretty modest bedroom community just outside of, there, but I was always 10 minutes away from where we, we had grown up. Uh, so I saw, you know, a side and knew that there was more. And I just watched my dad and my dad put his nose to the grindstone and, and made it work for our family. And then my uncle, you know, gets, gets injured and, you know, I see him, he didn't give up on it on life. And he came from the same background. It was same family. My mother and him grew up in the same house and I grew up there with my grandparents. And, yeah. and it, it's one of those things where you're just like, wow, I can't, yeah, I, you know, like I, if I really applied myself, you know, I, and I, and you see it and you can see a difference and then there's motivation and in, in wanting to get yourself out of those situations. And then once you're there, you want to reach back to the people that are there and help them out. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's, that's important. So you're, I think you're, you know, the stimuli piece is, is right there. If you, if you go around and you, you look for other ways to do stuff, they'll present themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Well, given the same amount of extreme inspiration and extreme desperation, why do you think some people make the choice to change and others don't? You know, that's a deep question, man. You know, and, and I think part of it is um, who you are inside. Um, there are folks out there that are type A personalities that are going to take the leap no matter what. Like, I, that's a hard question for me because I'm an entrepreneur. I have such a high risk tolerance yeah. that for me, like my mom wanted me to to be do oh do computers she didn't even know what it meant but she's like just do <laughs> computers and you know and i when i was switching jobs she's like what are you doing like why don't you just stay in your job you have a job why would you risk leaving that job and I'm like well i want to do something else you know and when i started my business it's like oh all these businesses fail only you know and for me it wasn't a choice it was like hey well yeah i can do this so let me let me go and do it and i'll suffer through some of this uh and i think every obstacle that i've had in life has come from that it's like can i if I get knocked down, can I get back up? And not every business venture that I've had has gone well. You know, thankfully, some of them have gone well enough that it, that makes a difference in my life. Others, you'll you'll learn from, right? And yeah. then there are folks that just won't do that. They're they're afraid to take that that leap. And um, thankfully, I'm not one of them. Love it. There we go. Some people need a small amount of desperation or inspiration to change, and others need a larger, more consistent amount. What do you think establishes that threshold and can it be influenced? Yeah. So 
I think that those thresholds are environmental and I think they're also genetic, right? Like I think some people are just predisposed to fight and be successful at what they do. And it doesn't matter what that is. That could be being a better parent. It could be, be being a better teacher it, it, finding ways around things. Like I, I, I knew teachers that didn't have, I mean, the classroom wasn't prepared to do the stuff the teacher wanted to do and they spent money out of their own pocket. And, you know, you, you, you know, those kind of things and they were going to make that work no matter what. Yeah. Uh, and it's those kind of motivated people that I think will use that, whether it's a little bit of desperation or like you said, a constant desperation, you know, and in some cases that constant desperation can come from environment, right? It's like, I've got to get myself out of the doldrums that I'm in, or I've got to work on my mental health to get over these obstacles or else I'm just going to keep falling back and reaching out for help and seeing that there's different ways of doing that. But also, you know, you can apply that to, to business and, and, and anything you want to do. And, you know, if you're if you're the kind that's going to stall when there's a challenge um, and you just rather kind of coast along and, and do the the least amount required, then, yeah, it doesn't really matter what's put in front of you. You're always going to be, you know, a sea level person. Right. And, yeah. you know, but, you know, but if you, you know, it, 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 like I said, I've met, I've I've gone to co- I was the first person in my family in any generation to go to college. You know what I mean? I, you know, I started a business. I sold that business. I started three other businesses, some of which went well, some of which didn't go well, you know, but it's, I think that, you know, it's, I've learned something from each step and you just get better at that. And I think it's that constant, like for me, it's fear of failure that motivates me. And that's your constant in your example. For me, I don't want to fail and I'll, I'll do anything I can not to fail. And um, sometimes it's healthy. Sometimes it's it's not, you know, get you in trouble. But you know, like, the, but I, I think that honestly, you know, I like that kind of pressure to to perform well. I one of I uh, I listened to uh, uh, Heinz Ward, who's a former Pittsburgh Steeler, uh, and it's the same thing with him. It was always like, oh, I'm not the best, and people tell me that and he needed locker locker room material, that built bulletin board material every game before a game you know, and he would find ways to get mad at something, even if it wasn't even relevant, but it motivated him, right? It was that constant push as opposed to that stark pow. I think when someone's presented with something that's a a life-altering event, they're going to have to deal with it one way or the other. It's either they're going to shell up, you know, turtle up and and not be able to deal with it, which is the wrong way to do it, or it's embrace it and find a way to get around it and reach out to others. And hopefully they'll be there with a helping hand to pull you up. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like that a lot. I do think it is interesting. It's just, it's why I ask these questions, honestly, because just from pure observation, you just see people that are more prone to take action. And then you see people that are less prone to take action and who have been that way their whole life. Granted, there are the cases of people who were poor. They were, had a poor mindset, poor physical body. Like David Goggins was a perfect example, lived a bunch of his life as basically a nobody doing nothing and then made the switch in his mind said, I'm gonna be the best Navy SEAL. I'm going to like be in shape. I'm going to be a person that I'm proud of looking at. And he made the flip. And so I fully believe that flip is possible for everybody, but some people are born like wanting to make that flip happen. And then others are just okay with never making that flip happen. And that's where I'm just like, that, that's the, that's the question I'm like constantly asking. <laughs> yeah. It sticks in your car. Like I, I could not imagine not, you know what I mean? Yep. I've had good and bad things happen in my life. Ugly things happen in my life. And, you know, you, sure, they affect you. You know, you're everybody's human. You know, you're not going to get up that same day. But, you know, you got to make a decision on whether or not you want to do that. And it, and I think that just comes with the, with the person. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then it, what's interesting is, you know, some people will be like born that way of like, yeah, I don't really want anything for my life. But then they'll change. And then other people like, well, <laughs> it's just like why like why are you staying there come on yeah. I, you know and there's simple things too i mean it, it could be the easiest most subtle things like you get married or you have kids and all of a sudden what you were wanting to do is now translated to something else and now you've got to change your direction and your life changes as, as a result of that or or there's you know an injury like with my uncle you know what i mean that was something he was serving his country and he got injured and as a result of that you know his life changed and that impacted me the stuff i'm doing in my life has been inspired by watching what he did. And I can't imagine, 
sort of sitting around just saying, wow, I, I feel sorry for myself. I'd rather go out there and try to overcome those things. And, and know if you don't win, at least you went down swinging, right? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Man, it's crazy how our beliefs impact us. Awesome. Yeah, well, I we got one, so. one last question for you. Fire away. So for this question, keep in mind a person with a fixed mindset, they're not willing to accept help and they're not willing to accept change. So in Atomic Habits, James Clear talks about the four laws of changing your behavior. <laughs> and he says the laws are to make it obvious, make it attractive, make it easy, and make it satisfying. With that context in mind, and the avatar I kind of just told you to keep in your head, how can we, you and I, create an environment that makes it more obvious, more attractive, more easy, and more satisfying for that avatar to make the choice that will change their life? that's a real philosophical one isn't it it is <laughs> yeah so um well that's a tough one to answer on the spot to be fair it is yeah, no, I, I think totally. that the, yeah to, to dig into that a little bit um you know the per to make it obvious the person has to accept that it's obvious we all know people that are struggling and they just don't seem to figure a way out of it. Right. And so I think part one is that on the obvious side is, um, you know, they have to, they themselves have to see how obvious it is that they need to change, whether yeah. they're looking in the mirror and it's something physical that they don't like, or, or whether they're, they're looking at the relationships and it's something emotional that they need to change. Um, or even something in their job where it's like, wow, I just, I can't, I'm not going to go to work today. Like I just, it's time for me to look for something else, right? Yeah. And it, it, they've got to hit that, and they've got to come to that realization on their on their own. On on the attractive side, you would think that obvious and attractive kind of go hand in hand, right? So you get, you get this thing where it's like, all right, well, I need I know I need to make a change, and to make it attractive enough for me to do this, I've I've got to commit to it. And whether it's you know I got to hit the gym uh, once a day, or I've got to eat well, or in some cases, you know I've got to switch my job, or I've got to I got to spend more time with my kids, or you know, I've got to find a way to do something different. Um, I think setting those goals, that's one of the reasons I make those lists. You know, I know that, you know, uh, you know, without sounding too Tony Robbins-ish, you know, like the the the, the idea that it, you, you need to change gradually. You can't change. Well, people that go cold turkey, it never works. Or yeah. people are going to make a massive change. And meanwhile, it's like, look, just just change one aspect, you know, and I think the what's the the rule of thumb is it takes 28 days to get rid of a bad habit. Don't try getting rid of five bad habits at the same time. Yeah. You know, tackle the one you want to get rid of first. And then once you get rid of that, you'll recognize, wow, I did that. I can do the next and the next and the next. And so I think that sort of makes it attractive as long as, and as well as the goals on the other end, even if you have to treat yourself to something, it's like, look, if I, I lose that weight or I get this job, I'm going to buy myself something or I'm going to go on this trip or I'm going to do something special for my family. That should be motivating enough to, for, for them to do that. So, you know, I, you know, I think that you there's there's ways of, of making that work i'm not you know uh, you know i have to think a little bit more on that one but i hope i've tried to answer your question fair and and you know i you know i think that that's for me that that's the kind of stuff that would motivate me uh to, to make changes so i i kind of agree with the, the assertions his four principles of it um you know but i i also think that some some people just will never change yeah yeah <laughs> Yep. It's a, it was a hard thing for me to accept, but I've accepted it. Some people will never change. <laughs> yeah. You mean you just, uh, I'll ruin try. my life trying to change them. Like, yeah. Right. You try, <laughs> you, you try to be there for them. And you get, you get that all the time where it's like, they're the ones that are going to want to do it. Yeah. You know, you, you can be there, just be there when they're ready, you know, and don't back down. And, you know, cause sometimes, you know, I get that too, where you just feel like you're in someone's face. Like, why aren't you doing this? Like you see they have the talent to do it. Yeah. Or you see they have the want to do it, but they just, it, it can't motivate themselves enough to do it. And I think that's where that, his principle of of not only making it obvious, they might see it, but also making it attractive enough for them to do it. So, yeah. yeah. Sometimes that's money. Sometimes that's love. Sometimes that's necessary for health reasons. There's a lot of different ways that you could kind of take, take a look at that for me. Absolutely. Uh, well, awesome. Joe, is there anything else you want to chat about before we sign off? You know, first of all, I want to thank you for doing this. Uh, this has been a really fun show. Uh, you know, some of them I go on and they're, they're you know, fun in a different direction. And we'll sit here and geek out and talk about 
what's better, Star Wars or Star Trek? Yeah. You know, or what characters are better, Indiana Jones or somebody else, right? And you get on those shows and they're, you know, they're geeky and they're fun. And you and all of a sudden you look at your watch and you're like, wow, that's that's gone. But I've spent almost an hour talking to you. I feel like it's been 10 minutes. <laughs> I think we've we kind of clicked and none of your questions are traditional questions. You know, like you 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 asked me a couple of cool ones. Hey, what's your favorite book? You know, what's your favorite movie? And that kind mm-hmm. of stuff. But, but you really dug into the person of me. And, um, you know, I think if you do that with all your guests, your guests will walk out. I'm going to walk off the show with a smile, you know, knowing that I talked about some stuff and that, you know, um, and it wasn't the same stuff that I've had on other shows. And I could tell you put some time into this This is something you love. So I want to congratulate you on having, a, you know, a great show and, and a, a thematic, um, you know, a way of, of, of handling this stuff. So well done. Thank you so much. <laughs> that means a lot. That means a lot. Yeah, it's true. Awesome. Yeah, it was totally my goal when designing the show. So, oh, that makes me so happy to hear. <laughs> oh, good for you, my friend. Yeah. And, you know, and thank you for all of your your viewers uh, and those that are listening. Uh, you know, I appreciate your time tonight. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Joe, thank you for coming on the show. My pleasure, sir. Thanks again. And I will uh, I'll let you know when the next next book comes out. We'll, maybe we'll do this again at the end of the year. Maybe. There we go. And if you guys are listening to this and you loved what Joe had to say, you loved his vibe. Maybe you'll love his writing. Go check out his books. And if you do check them out, give one to a friend, rate them. Please rate them. Ratings are so important. As we always ask, shoot this podcast over to one to three people you know need to hear this message. Go ahead and give us a five-star review on iTunes if you liked us. And on that note, we're out.